Bangalore, um, but before it's, it was the Bangalore that it is today. So, um, I mean, if I were to tell you that I saw Jack all in, pretty much everyone here is from Bangalore, right? Yes. A lot of them are, yeah. Okay. I'm not from Bangalore. Oh, okay. But I saw Jack all in the heart of the city. I Slender Loris is uh, in places like Koromangla. Um, it's, uh, it was a very wild place, but um, uh, and a very green place. So I had a lot of opportunity to, uh, to not go to school and, uh, sorry parents, to not go to school and, uh, and, and explore. So it was, it, it was uh, back in the day before internet, so I couldn't ask Google anything. I had to pretty much experiment everything on my own and find out things, uh, sometimes the hard way. Um, but I did realize that what I really wanted to do, and uh, the only thing that brought me tremendous joy was uh, working and being with animals. So, um, uh, and I was also very fortunate to live outside even what was then a small little town in city. I, I lived far outside on a place called Sajapur Road. Um, and there was nothing, in fact, even Koramangla was mostly plantations uh, when I was growing up. So, um, um, and we were 14 kilometers outside of that. And uh, it was very wild. So there were leopard around, there was a lot of snakes, uh, tremendous bird life, chameleons and slender lorises in the hedge around our farm. So I, uh, I got the opportunity to, to spend a lot of time in nature. I was also able to, when those are the days when the lakes in Bangalore were clean and uh, you could actually swim in them. So I've even swum in Alsur Lake, which is near MG Road, if you guys know. It was very, very clean. In fact, the, uh, the funny part was the, the swimming pool that was there, we had to pay 50 paisa for the morning to be able to use the swimming pool. But there were so many people who'd use the swimming pool that it was probably cleaner to swim in the lake. So most of us just swam in the lake. And uh, the lake also offered us the added bonus of being able to catch some fish or the occasional snake. So, um, uh, but you know, Bangalore still has a lot of this wildlife and nature clinging on. So it, it, what would be great is if today, we've, we also spoke about things like whether it's possible for you to even explore things in your balconies, outside your windows, uh, your front lawn, maybe. Um, so, but as I was growing up, I realized more and more that the academics weren't for me. Uh, and there were a few things that worked to my benefit. The first was that I was, uh, my mom is a Montessori teacher. So she, uh, so I learned how to learn very early in life. Uh, but the more I learned how to learn, the less I learned how to remember. And school in those days was pretty much having to recite what you'd learn, uh, what you'd, you'd have to just memorize it all. And uh, that didn't work very well for me. Um, I enjoyed sports uh, and I enjoyed music and extracurricular activities, but my grades were like, I don't know, something out of a, an air crash type of movie. Yeah. So, um, so finally, when I was, uh, after I, I didn't finish my high school, I didn't finish my 12th grade, I, I sort of stopped. Uh, my parents were in the Middle East, uh, and I was here in, in India, so it made it easier. My granddad was not particular about much at all. So um, I just left home and I landed up at uh, the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. And uh, I had read the biography of a person named Romulus Whitaker, who had been quite an inspiration. Um, and I, from the time I was maybe 11 or 12, I wanted to start, you know, I wanted to work with him and learn from him. So I uh, pretty much landed up on his doorstep at around six in the morning and uh, asked him if I could stay. And uh, he said no. So I, well, I begged and he allowed me to, to stay for a few days that ended up being almost four and a half years. Um, and uh, that's where my career actually started. And I was surrounded by, you know, thousands of reptiles and really amazing people who researched, uh, who were researching these animals. I got to work with, uh, so my college was basically working with these scientists who'd come from all over the world. Um, to study the animals that were at Crocbank. And uh, Crocbank was quite spectacular. The first day that I 
I walked in to Croc Bank. It was very early in the morning. So there was no public or anything there. And uh, I, I remember very clearly walking past hundreds of crocodiles. And I stopped at this bend at the, where there were these water monitor lizards and iguanas. And then I walked further down because I'd, I'd been uh, directed to go and meet Rom uh, much, uh, much further down past all the enclosures. And on the way, I saw uh, these, this room, uh, this big enclosure. And I peeped into the door and there, there was this massive 13 foot King Cobra. And I thought, okay, yes, I, this is where I have to work. So, um, so I went and met Rom. And then later that day, uh, I was sitting in the library and Rom walked past and he said, uh, um, do you want to see some crocodile eggs hatching? And this was a bit too much sensory uh, uh, overload for me because this was day one. I had seen king cobras. I had watched crocs being fed. I had, and now I'm going to, I was going to see crocodiles hatching. And I didn't know much about crocodiles at all back then. So I, uh, um, so I went. Uh, I mean, like puppy following Rom around to the uh, to the nursery, and the crocodiles that were hatching were Siamese crocodiles, which are amongst the rarest in the world. And uh, and yeah, it was just tremendously. Um, it, it helped me make my decision to stay. And I decided that I'd do whatever I needed to, to make that a reality. And before this, the, my only experience with the crocodiles was a crocodile that I rescued from uh, a zoo in Goa, because it was, it was pretty much, it had a big wound on its head and uh, crows were pecking at it and all that stuff. And it was a small crocodile. So I had reached over the pen wall and I picked it up and put it in my knapsack and took it home. So, uh, yeah, don't do those things. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, so that was the only crocodile I had. But I learned a lot from that crocodile, uh, uh, just in the fact that it responded. They, they learn your voice. They know they can recognize it. They uh, uh, they have their own schedules. They have their own personalities. Um, and while I was there, uh, uh, Rom uh, asked me if I would work on taking care of the king cobras, which was like a dream come true for me. I, uh, yeah, and uh, Rom was doing a film called King Cobra. It was the first film uh, on king cobras. It was for the National Geographic. And I was taking care of the, the, the king cobras and we were meant to breed them. And we had no clue how to do it back then because we didn't know much about uh, the snakes at all. So we did all kinds of things to sort of replicate the rainforest um, uh, environment. So we kept the temperatures low and kept it very humid and we'd constantly spray them. But one of the coolest things that we had to do was train the snakes, the king cobras, which feed only on snakes to feed on rats because we, were, we weren't getting permission to feed our king cobras snakes. So, um, so we had to find uh, roadkill snakes that were dead on the road and then the rats had to be we had to well cut off all the fur from them and uh, because we didn't know if the fur would sort of get stuck in the in the digestive system of the, of the king cobras and then we had to take out the rats guts because rats guts have a lot of infection in them and we didn't know if that infection would be too much for king cobras so yeah the junior gets to do all those kind of things and uh and then we had to rub these rats onto this soup that we'd made of this uh, this dead uh, uh, roadkill snake, and um, and then tie the rats in a chain and sort of make the snakes think that uh, that they was that the rat the chain of rats was actually a snake, and it worked. And after a few months, we were able to just you know drop a rat down, and the king cobras would eat them. But uh, so yeah, the, there's numerous stories of you know funny things that we did. Um, but then during the filming of that, uh, um, of King Cobra, I, uh, I was very fortunate to be slave on that, uh, on that project. So I got to go to all these really cool places. We went to the Perambiculum uh, National Park. It's now a tiger reserve, uh, Silent Valley National Park. Uh, I got to see so many wonderful, wonderful places. And, uh, and, and then, um, in 98 or 99, I sort of moved back to Bangalore and uh, I had gotten involved with National Geographic and they started doing a bunch of 
uh, films that I was sort of on camera for. And, uh, and then in 2000, I became what they call the National Geographic Adventurer, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's something that you, you get called because you're on TV and you're doing stuff that people like watching. Uh, but I, it really television wasn't for me because it was, uh, uh, it, it, it sort of made, uh, it wasn't real enough for me. I, I don't like uh, making, uh, I don't like making films. Uh, I enjoyed actually doing the work. But um, as a television presenter, most of the time, you're not really doing the work yourself. It's just stuff that other people are doing. And then, um, and it's very sensational. Um, but when it comes to working with animals, I think what's really appealed to me all my life and what I didn't um, follow for those few years that I was in television was the calmness that you do it with. And when you're working in television, uh, can you imagine... Uh, You've seen people handle venomous snakes and how they jump all over the place and they go, you know, crikey, mate, that's such a dangerous snake and all those kind of things. But it's, uh, that's not how you work with animals and animals don't appreciate it either. So what I realized in a few years, it took me, it took me a while to realize that, uh, was that what I really wanted to do was be myself and really truly work with animals and with people. So I started working uh, in an organization called I Discover I Education, where I took children out into the wild and uh, into the wilderness and I would help them learn, um, well, their studies, their, their school stuff from, uh, from nature. So for physics, we do rock climbing, uh, for biology, we build ponds, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and finally I came back to working uh, purely with animals um, when I started my work with snake bite in around about 2009 or so. Um, so, and now we live on a farm that is very close to the Nagarhole Tiger Reserve. So we have some of the small wildlife uh, here, but no elephants and stuff, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we did find a leopard uh, on our, one of our camera traps recently. And we regularly get civets and jungle cats and jackals and the occasional wild boar. So, so there is a lot of life and wildlife here as well. And what we're doing now is we're trying to work with the community to uh, cut down the number of um, snake bites and deaths caused by snake bites in India. So India has a lot of snake bites uh, every year, over a million. And uh, the number of people who, who die due to snake bites is about 60,000. So we're working on, on trying to solve that problem. And uh, for that reason, we have a lot of snakes here. I'm going to first take you to, would you like to see some of them? Thumbs up if you'd like to see some of them. Yep. Yeah, I think snakes are a lot more interesting than me just talking, isn't it? Thumbs up if you agree with that. That's so many thumbs. Wow, all right. Thank you guys, you're doing wonders for my self-esteem. All right. I'm gonna hide behind my mask and go and find the snake to show you guys, okay. Oops, I need to take, I need to take the internet with me. There we go. I'm gonna turn around. This is part of the arm. Some of the screen here. I can confirm the faces. Okay. Uh, Jerry, I think and we, Jerry, I think we've lost your video. Oh. Ah, you're back. Is it back now? Yeah, you're back. Okay, now. cool. All right. Well, we get blue skies and uh, fresh air and lots of wildlife, but the flip side is our internet provider is not so great. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to Baby Corn, who okay, let me put this down. All right, so that's Baby Corn. She's a corn snake. 
corn. Baby corn, his name is. Because he's a corn snake. Is that snake venomous? No, it's not. I'll show you a venomous snake in just a bit. But uh, if it was ven venomous, we I wouldn't be holding it like this. But baby corn is actually a pet snake that we we got from someone who had her as a baby, as a pet. And uh, we're now... Uh, Sir, will this sorry. be in the corn's crop? Uh, yeah. So basically, they're called corn snakes because they found a lot in corn. But that's not because they eat corn. It's because they, there's a lot of rats in corns, in corn fields and corn snakes like rats. So, so are they always the same color? Thank you, sir. Are corn snakes venomous? Okay, so we're going to have to do uh, questions one at a time somehow, but corn snakes are non-venomous. And uh, what was the other question? Do they, do they live in cornfields? They do live in cornfields. And uh, no, they're not always the same color. In fact, let me show you. So they... You know how goldfish and budgerigars and everything have been uh, uh, have been bred to be different colors, right? So so have corn snakes. So this one is sweet corn, right? and that's baby corn, and they've both been bred to be different colors. Uh, sweet corn is actually closer to the natural color. In the wild, they usually pretty uh, uh, pretty much the same color all the time, which is closer to this color. I put them back here. Okay, I will go see something else. So, you know what a, a good time to ask questions would be while I'm walking from one place to another. Corn snake grow to? How long? Uh, about. Okay, so first thing, there's a really important rule, okay? Nobody calls me sir. Right? You can just call me Jerry. Okay. If you must, you can call me uncle, but yeah, Jerry works really well. Okay, so uh, they grow to about six feet, uh, just under two meters. Okay, here we go. The keys here, the keys are here. So I am going to show you another pretty cool snake. And uh, Shana, you could maybe ask the questions if folks have questions. Sure. Um, so you guys can feel free to just raise your hands and ask, or you can put the questions in the chat box. Um, so, Jerry, one of the questions that has come through uh, just personal chat is um, from a kid who's a little bit older and is basically saying, you know, if I'm not good at math or science, can this still be an area that I can go into? Can I still become a wildlife researcher? Uh, yes, you can actually. In fact, uh, uh, there's so many different things that you can do uh, for to actually be a wildlife researcher that um, uh, it any skill you have, provided you're willing to work meticulously and very hard, um, uh, is valuable to wildlife research. So you could be an artist and be valuable in wildlife research and conservation. You could be I mean, people who are dancers and actors and, uh, uh, you know, various sculptors, um, musicians, uh, pilots, architects, everyone, they, they, everyone has a role to play in wildlife research and conservation. So 
know if you guys have a question, let me know. I, I actually have a question, uh, Jerry. Um, so a lot of the, the speakers and things that we've had and a lot of people that I've just spoken to who have achieved any kind of success in their life, they've always talked about this idea of persistence, like someone in their life told them no. You know what, I think uh, what you have looks a lot more exciting. I'll hold my question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is actually the largest species of snake in the world. It's the green anaconda. And this one's just a little over two years old and is already a little over uh, almost six feet long. So it's going to be really, really big, but this one's a male and he came to us very, very, very sick and almost dead in fact, we were able to re uh, revive him. And he is now, uh, yeah, we call him Hulk, which is not the most imaginative for a large green animal, but, uh, yeah, he's a green anaconda. And for those of you who have seen the film, uh, anacondas aren't like that at all. They're slow, they're sluggish, they don't have green eyes. And anacondas don't need fangs because they're not venomous. They constrict their prey. So anacondas are not native to India. How did you come by it? So unfortunately, uh, there's, a, there's a very large pet trade in, uh, well, in India and all over the world. But uh, folks have smuggled in tons and tons of different kinds of animals. And very often what, and they even sold in pet stores and all that stuff. And people pick them up and then they don't know how to keep them. So some of these end up here. And uh, yeah, so we adopt them basically. Uh, they usually come to us in really terrible condition though. Does the snake recognize you? Snakes don't recognize individual people. Uh, they might recognize the smell, but they don't form bonds or anything like that. When did you start researching wildlife? Sorry, one second. When did you start researching about wildlife? When I started researching, uh, oof, um, the first project I actually did um, was with uh, a colleague at the Madras Crocodile Bank named Dr. Indranil Das. And the first thing I actually had to do was we had to collect a whole bunch of these small little toads called Ferguson's toads um, uh, that were, they were mating. And then we had to collect their eggs and keep each clutch of eggs separately. And my job was to count the number of eggs in each clutch three times. So, um, yeah, it's, and then we did a, sh a short paper. We wrote up a short paper, and that was the first time I did research. But I started learning and working with uh, animals much, much before that, when I was a child. Uh, most, I mean, as old as most of you are at the moment. So, yeah. So, uh, Shaina, you were asking a question as well. Yeah, um, before I get a to question. the question, sorry, I can't. Did you me. know that a long time ago, before humans ever existed, Dita, a very big snake, even bigger than the green anaconda, roamed the earth? It worked. I it think he means Titanoboa. Titanoboa, yes. Not Bola, Boa. It's bigger than the green anaconda. Yes, it was. Way bigger. Way, way, way bigger. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. Shri, right? Thanks. Shri. It was so big that, not, that it could eat anything. Even it, it even ate crocodiles. Yes. You know that you know that even the green anaconda eats crocodiles even today? Yeah. What? But it swallows crocodiles much easier. Everything it can eat. The degree the 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 titanabola can eat anything. It is the largest snake in the gas ever known. Yes. Do the snake has bones? Can it eat a house? Any snake that's the largest. So it's hard. 
cola. This snake or anaconda has bones. Uh, yes, all snakes have bones. All snakes have bones and all snakes have backbones. Uh, they are vertebrates uh, like us. So I can see someone's hand up waiting very patiently. That is Nishika. Which country is the anaconda native to? So it's from Central and South America. Uh, it's, uh, but it's all over the world in the pet trade. And one of the big problems with the pet trade is it very often leads to what are called invasive species. Now, invasive species are species that uh, aren't from a particular area, but they, uh, they, they, they sort of come through the pet trade or some other way, and then they do really well in that area, and they outdo the local wildlife. Either they feed on them or they compete with them, and, uh, and that really the, was a big problem for the local uh, ecosystems. And this is a huge problem in, in many places. And I'm very worried about what it, what's it going to happen in India because India is great for a lot of these species. Um, so if you have any pet, a turtle, a fish, a bird, never let it out into the open without checking whether it's from the area or not. You can always rehome it, okay? But don't let it out into the open, into the wild. Okay. Uh, it looks like Aliyah has. Adia? A oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. I, yeah. Uh, Anyone? Like, uh, actually, Shana, do I'm you, doing your job. <laughs> do you have only snakes or like crocodiles and other animals? We've got we've got a few um, crocodiles, like three of them. They're not they're not true crocodiles. Uh, they are crocodilians. They're called dwarf caiman. Uh, they're on the other end of the farm. Uh, but we've got ponies and donkeys and uh, goats and cows as well. Um, a bunch of different uh, animals here. Some we've adopted, some, we've, some we keep uh, chickens, we get our own eggs, all that kind of stuff. So there's lots and lots of animals here. So you guys can continue asking me the questions and I'm just going to show you one of our research animals now. So one of the big issues that we have with uh, with with snake facing snake bite treatment in the country can snake, is can snake taste and smell food. So I'll get to that. I think that was Virat. Yeah. So guys, you know what will help is if you uh, if you wait until uh, I finish a sentence, so that we can then discuss stuff together. And questions can be asked uh, through you know. That would, that would help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, we so. have a few people who've raised their hands. We'll wait for Jerry to finish what he's talking about. Then we'll get to all of your questions. Okay. All right. So uh, one of the big issues is that we don't even understand the venom of most of the snakes. And across the country, the same species of snake might have a different venom. And there's also many places that, that there are other species that are causing a lot of snake bite. So one of the things that we're doing is we are looking at uh, uh, the venom of snakes and whether the antivenom is working against it. And we're trying to make antivenom better. So the treatment will get better of snakes. And for that, we've got permission to keep some of the Indian species as well. Now, keeping an Indian species of any wildlife requires special permission. So you should never keep an Indian species at all without getting the due permission. So that's you know things like star tortoises, a turtle that you find on the road, those kind of things. Uh, and if you find other species like a, a, you know, a green, one of those green turtles that uh, they sell in, the, in pet stores and all that stuff, uh, it's, those are the kind of things that you can keep, but always get someone to advise you on how to keep them, all right? Just one second. I'm just gonna get you a snake to see. So thank you. I see, I think at least six hands are raised. So I do see all of your hands. So we're, we're going to get to all of you guys. Okay.
Okay, so this is a spectacle cobra. Okay. What species is it, is it again? A spectacle cobra. A spectacle cobra. Common it has a toad out. It, it, it can... has a out. So it's the most common species of uh, cobra in the country. It's found uh, almost all over the country, except in the Northeast and, uh, and the Andamans, of course. But uh, you can see most people will like constantly be jumping around. Uh, they make the snake strike, all those kinds of things. But the snake doesn't want uh, to get into any form of confrontation. Just I get to... it because, because when a cobra bites, it releases all its venom and then it dies because it oh, needs that's... venom to survive. You need a baby. Why do we call? Well, that's not true at all. The cobra doesn't release all its venom and it doesn't die after it bites. Um, cobras, in fact, does the king cobra bite. do that? Because I heard. That, no. Uh, when no. I was in Kurg, uh, uh, wildlife. Okay. Yeah, about it. The king. Okay, hang on, hang on. That is. Do you think? Do the snake bite? Can you guys all mute yourself? Okay. Now I think there's over there's over forty of you. Okay. Yeah. And if. No, you guys need to stay muted. All right. Um, all right. So now, if you guys start talking when I'm mid-sentence, there are two problems with that. One, we won't get far with this conversation at all. And two, it's very unfair to the folks who are sitting very patiently and following the norms of the conversation by putting their hands up. Okay. So what I'm going to stop doing is responding to anyone who talks. Uh, without their hand up. And Shana is going to be the only person who is going to call out who's, who, who can ask a question when, all right? So now, cobras, that's the most common species of uh, cobra. Uh, no snake bites and then dies, that's only with bees. Uh, bees sting and then, will, and then die, all right? So um, it's, um, uh, but snakes don't bite for no reason either. All right, and one of the things that I'm going to show you some of the other species that we have here. All right, all snakes will either try and hide, get away, or warn you in some way or the other. Here's one that's out. Now, this is a species that we're actually really focusing on. Can you guys see that clearly enough? Yes, we can, Jerry. Okay, so that's a Russell's viper. And this is a species that we're actually focusing most on because it's the one that's involved in the highest amount of conflict. Uh, I mean, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people get bitten by them every year. And, um, and that's because a Russell's viper chooses to hide. It doesn't flee as much as, uh, so snakes will either run away or hide to stay safe. And uh, the Russell's viper chooses to hide and it's really good at hiding. So people don't see it and sometimes step on it. Okay. Um, shall we get to some questions, Shana? Because hands are collecting. We'll start with Vidyuta. If you can unmute yourself. Oh, I wanted to know how snakes communicate with each other. Um, so snakes, well, they, they have ears, but the ears are not open to the outside. So they can't really hear most uh, sounds like us talking and stuff but they can feel vibrations, but communicating with each other is all chemical. So they don't need to speak to each other most of the time, but when they do need to mate or whatever, then they, they actually uh, will, uh, uh, you know, the female will give out a, a chemical, it's called a pheromone, and then the males will get attracted to, to her and, and then they'll, they'll mate. But otherwise they don't really chat much. Okay. Uh, the next person, uh, the name given is CBS South. Yeah, this is my mother's phone, so it's okay. that name. Go ahead. I wanted to ask if um, constrictors, you have constrictors, like boa constrictors and all that. 
uh, what about constrictors boa constrictors boa constrictors in komodo dragon do you have them nope nope don't have boa constrictors and don't have komodo dragons oh okay thank you <laughs> thank you next no is rishan do you have eyelash wipers no i haven't even seen an eyelash viper in the wild yet they're really really cool animals though all right next is adya i just wanted to ask that you had showed a snake before why is it called as a spectacle snake spectacle cobra yeah a... so spectacle cobra is actually have a, a a mark at the back with two circles and then a u that sort of looks like the old uh, uh spectacle drawings that people would have when they had those round spectacles with way before your time unfortunately so uh it looks like uh, the drawing of a spectacle the mark on the back of the hood is actually something that is used by the snake to sort of startle um uh, anything that's attacking it so it spreads its hood and those two circles look like eyes and if like say a uh, A, a a bird of prey or a cat is trying to attack it it'll spread its hood and it might, it usually gives the snake a little while uh just a, a split second to try and escape all right next we have ishir uh, i just wanted to clarify if the russell viper was venomous yes russell vipers are very venomous and uh, unfortunately venomous um it's quite a cocktail of different uh, things so it causes a lot of damage as well and that's one of the big issues we're facing and next we have krish um so i came to your farm maybe like 2 years ago in a school field trip for one whole week and i remember seeing this baby bat that you found wounded or something and you're rehabilitating and your plan was to like obviously rehabilitate yes. it and then release it in the wild so by now you probably would have done that but my question mm-hmm. is have you um put some sort of microchip in it or something that you've been like tracking it and like checking up on it every so often to check on its well-being and stuff No we didn't put anything in it uh, but yeah that was a fruit bat and we called him Vlad the vegan uh, yeah that's right that, i remember uh, yeah he did he did actually stay around for quite a while so he was here uh, and we saw him many times and he's he was doing absolutely fine uh, so yeah uh, the thing is with with uh, with animals that you rehabilitate and all this uh, it it is important to to do the best you can but more important than that is to make sure that the space that you have for them in the wild is uh uh is safe and secure and stable um otherwise you know no matter how many snakes or how many animals or anything that you rescue you're not going to achieve very much so one of the things that we really do here is we try our best to ensure that the the habitat is is as intact as possible okay thanks krish good memory uh next step we have kalpana hi uh, my name is laksha uh, i wanted to know if uh, where do more snakes live in the country india okay so this uh, so you know uh, there are lots and lots of different kinds of snakes and in india we have over 300 species and there are some places which have a lot of certain kinds of snakes and others that have other snakes but generally snakes like to live in like more warm uh, climates so closer to the equator so the tropics have the highest uh, concentration of all reptiles because they need the warmth um and then as you go further north or further south from the equator the number of reptiles and snakes as well that you get becomes less in india there's a few places that have a lot of snakes and uh, so the western ghats is one such re- region so you know the mountain range and all the forests on the west coast that's one place and then the northeast of india and the andaman and nicobar islands and these places are called biodiversity hotspots because they have they have a very high uh, number of species but they also have a very high number of species that are found only in those regions which is called endemicity 
So, so those, these anim, these spaces are very, very important to conserve. Thank you. Welcome. All right, next we have Ahana. So actually, I'm not fear of snakes. Who, me? Yeah. Uh, I am actually scared of snakes. It's, uh, it's good to be a little scared. Uh, not being scared of something that can harm you is not a good, uh, is not good really. So, but um, it, it, it's important to have a healthy respect for animals and never treat them as, uh, as toys or a prop of some sort or the other. But handling venomous snakes is, is really something that pretty much anyone can learn. More important than having the skill of handling is having the mindset of how to approach animals of any sort, including those that are dangerous, that could be dangerous to you. So uh, there's a lot of snake rescuers around the country, snake handlers around the country who get, uh, who, who are getting bitten now because they use snakes more as a show prop and, and lack the respect that these animals require, not just because they're dangerous, but because they're animals. Sir, and uh, which is the very dangerous snake uh, which you have experienced with it? Um, uh, so, no snake is really dangerous because uh, um, unless you're trying to handle it uh, or you're trying to do something with it because snakes generally like to keep away from, from us. They don't, most snakes don't eat us. Uh, but... Um, uh, handle, I guess, a, a black mamba. It's a, it's a bit of a difficult snake to handle, but it's not, it's nowhere near as uh, dangerous or difficult to handle as people say. It's that's all. I mean, when people talk about how dangerous animals are, it's like this cobra that I just had out can be con can be converted into a dangerous animal by stressing it out or make it strike. But generally, the fact that snakes don't want to bite us is is enough to not get bitten by snakes. The next person is Cornelius Seven. What? Um, so I heard like Cornelius um, Seven. snakes are scared of the um, sounds, some of them. Are also some attracted to sounds uh, or like well, yeah, no snake is scared of sound because they can't, it's not one of their strong senses, uh, but vibrations, uh, some snakes will, will move away, but some snakes will, will choose to hide. So, but none of them are attracted to them, no. None of them are attracted to vibrations or sounds. Yeah. Next we have Tamara. Um, so I, have, I, um... I can't hear anything. Okay, Tamara, while you sort uh, out... Sir, I wanted to know what happens when we see a snake on the road? Uh, what happens or what you should do? Uh, sir, I can't hear you. Do, do you want to know what happens or what you should do? Uh, so what we if should you do? see a snake on a road. So uh, just leave do? it be. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah, just let it be. It'll find its own way. It'll move, move around. You can actually, from a distance, watch snakes as well. Just as long as you're not getting close to them, you'll be absolutely fine. So, uh, um, I mean, if you see a snake uh, that's about 10 or 15 feet away from you, just step back a little bit and, and you can watch it. And as long as you're moving a little bit, it'll keep seeing you moving and it won't come towards you. So, it, um, but, you know, there's a lot of people who think that every time we see a snake, we have to catch it and move it and stuff like that. That's really not good for the snake. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of snakes around us anyway, so it's best just to leave them alone. Okay, uh, my brother wanted to know, what made you uh, get interested in wildlife? I have never been able to answer that question. I, I, I don't know. It's been since I was very, very, very young. And uh, yeah. I can't, I can't imagine not doing what I do. What did he ask, sir? 
Uh, he asked what made me get uh, interested in wildlife. Oh, okay. Next is Ria and Niva. Uh, yeah, um, I'm Ria. Uh, I had a question. Um, is there a particular age group for, uh, when, for the antidote when you get bitten by a snake for antivenom? Nope. Nope, nope, it's not like the coronavirus vaccination. Um, so it's in fact the same dose of antivenom, uh, no matter what age you are as well, because it's not about, uh, it's not like a medicine uh, that helps your body do something. It's, it's the antivenom is actually being injected into uh, the patient's bloodstream to directly neutralize and, and stop the effect of the venom that's in the blood. So, um, so yeah, it's the same dose, and it's uh, there's no age. You could be a newborn and, or or a great grandparent, and still have the same antivenom. And since you handle snakes a lot, do you have to get like before you get bitten? Do you have to get it like to prevent the venom or something? No. Um, it, so the antivenom doesn't work like that, and in fact, the antivenom can also be quite uh, uh, dangerous your body could react to it. So it's important not to take antivenom until, unless you really need it. Uh, the, the thing that we use to stay safe uh, from venomous snake bites is actually uh, a really awesome drug. It's called common sense and caution. Sorry, can you repeat that again? It's called common sense and caution. Okay, next up is Gyan. Gyan, can you? Yeah, there you go. I just wanted to ask, how did you gut rats? That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> okay. Um, I, wrote down, no I wrote down three questions, but no one really um, There's no thing answers. Really three the way we got, got we used to gut the rat is we used to first shave off all the hair, and then we used to cut the belly open and take out the, the digestive tract. It's, yeah, it's not fun at all. But the, the digestive tract used to be as well. So nothing was wasted. The other thing is, I went to your farm. I don't think you remember okay. me. I can't see who's asking that. Can you wave your hand like this? Oh, there you are. Uh, what is your name? Jen. You you come to the farm in Bangalore or at Hunsur? In your snake farm. My snake farm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. You're gonna have to come back again to remind me again. <laughs> Next up is Zarin. Hi. Um, everyone's asking how many snakes you have. Maybe you could answer that. And I have uh, two questions about the anaconda. Okay. Uh, how many snakes? Well, at the moment we have about 70, but uh, once we, uh, over the next year or so, it'll go up to f about 400. Uh, these are all snakes that have been, that uh, would be in some conflict scenario or the other. Uh, and these will be for the production of, uh, of venom for antivenom. And the about, questions about the anaconda? Yes, about the anaconda. So it's not, obviously not a native species and you cannot release it here in the wild. That would be invasive. Mm -hmm. So the one you have now is just two years old and it's fairly big. So you would need a very big enclosure as it grows. And how many years is a normal lifespan for an anaconda? So yes, we will need a very big enclosure. It's already in a really large enclosure, but uh, it's, well, as he grows, we're going to have to make a very big space for him. Uh, which we will. Um, uh, the lifespan, uh, they're known to live for 25 to 30 years, uh, probably longer, up to 40 years or so. I know that you are protecting the snakes and you keep them in those enclosures, but what is your opinion on keeping them in those little enclosures? What about, you know, what do you feel about them having space to move around? Is it healthy for them to be in those little enclosures? So um, basically, snakes need other things, uh, not necessarily space. They do need exercise, so we give them that as well. Uh, we are building a new serpentarium now uh, where we're hoping to have bioactive 
and live terrariums for each one of them. Um, but no, I mean, there's nothing that compares to an animal being free. Uh, and the fact remains that these animals will stay in captivity. Uh, and it's the only way that we can produce anti-venom at the moment. The good news is in the long run, we're hoping that that won't be needed anymore because, uh, well, colleagues of mine who are a lot smarter than I am working at the I in, in the Indian Institute of Science are looking for what are called uh, recombinant anti-venoms. And um, once, that, uh, once that work has been done, uh, we won't need to be collecting venom from uh, snakes to create anti-venom. Uh, the anti-venom will be synthesized. Um, but until then, uh, we need snakes both for the research and for the production of anti-venom. Thank you very much for answering and for your time today. And it was really interesting. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. So Jerry, we're coming up to 11 o'clock. Um, are you mm -hmm. able to go over by about five minutes? Sure, sure. No worries at all. Okay. All right. So next we have Divya. Divya. Okay, while we're waiting for Divya, we can go to Sanyukta. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yes. you. Okay, um, uh, pre uh, like um, uh, previously in the middle while you were explaining something, someone had asked a doubt. Uh, you said that we shouldn't uh, capture snakes, but then sometimes uh, when they feel threatened, they attack. So in such cases, uh, 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 why shouldn't we capture them? Like. Like they might, uh, even if they don't, the even if we are not like, we don't have the intentions to attack them. Like, what should we do? Don't threaten them. Oh, so, okay. so the thing is, we a, a lot of the reasons why, uh, the, a lot of the things, the decisions that we make when it comes to snakes and living with and around them, is um, is based on fear. Now, there there doesn't need to be conflict just because there's a snake and. Uh, a human in the same space, right? So if you look at it, things like, you know, high tension wires, electric wires, or or the highway between Bangalore and Mysore are much more dangerous okay, than snakes are. They're statistically much more dangerous. There's a lot more damage that happens in these areas. And, uh, but we're not, we're not worried about it because we don't have this fear of the highway, right? Snakes, are much safer than any of these things. And all we need to do is really watch what we're doing. It's like crossing a road, okay? You look both sides and then you cross. And if you're, if you're in an area that has snakes, you just have to be aware of what's around you and everything. We have tons of snakes, wild snakes around us, and it's lovely. We never disturb them. We watch them. I have a three-year-old son who, uh, and people keep asking me about, you know, what do we do in case, uh, because we have children. Children are really, really good at being careful. So all you have to do is show them what they need to be careful about. So snakes won't attack unless they're more than just threatened. The moment they're threatened, they try to get away or they hide. They need to be troubled to bite. So if you don't trouble them, they won't bite. And you know it doesn't mean that you mean to trouble them. You might do something without knowing. So you have to just be careful about doing the things that trouble them. Don't step on them. Don't pick them up. Don't try and attack them and, they'll be, and you'll be fine. One more doubt. Uh, how, which is the most deadliest snake you've come across till now? So you know that the whole concept of deadly snake is a tough one to answer because do you mean the snake with the strongest venom? Do you mean the snake that kills the most number of people? Do you mean the, you know, there's so many different um, yardsticks and so many different ways of measuring what we call deadly. In my opinion, there is no such thing as a deadly snake because, I mean, mosquitoes are a lot more deadly than snakes are. Uh, but, um, but if you were to handle a snake, which is the hardest one to handle, like I said, it would be the black mamba. Uh, but then there are a lot of other snakes that uh, the Russell's viper, for example, is involved in so much conflict that that's, you know, that's high up on, on the scale there, but still none of them actually want to bite us. So there, there isn't really a deadly snake. And I think as long as we think of snakes as deadly and dangerous, there'll always be people who want to try and prove themselves. And the truth is, if you can learn how to ride a motorbike, you can learn how to handle a snake. It's not a big deal. 
Okay, thank you. I enjoyed the session a lot. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So next we'll go to Victoria. Hi. I wanted to Hi. know if you ever get bitten by a snake, we were told that we should never put a tourniquet on our arm. Anywhere we get bitten by a snake, we should not put a tourniquet. That's absolutely right, Victoria. Um, you should never tie anything around uh, the place that's bitten. Uh, all you need to do is stay as calm as possible. Take out anything like rings, bangles, watches, um, you know, uh, anything that might uh, become tight if, if swelling happens. And just get to hospital as soon as you can. So don't do anything else. Don't try and wash the wound. Don't do any of those things. Oh, well, so which is the snake that has the longest fangs of all snakes? Ooh. One, that's a really beautiful snake, actually. It's called the Gaboon Viper. And the fangs are about two inches long in an adult Gaboon Viper. They're very, very long. So we do have uh, a lot more questions, but I think we, uh, we will probably just, I'll just call on the two people that haven't had a chance to ask yet. And then the rest, you guys can uh, message me your questions on WhatsApp. I'll get them over to Jerry. Um, so let's see, we'll go with Jignissa. Before you go to anyone, I just want to say I'm going to be leaving. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Bye. All right, Jignissa. Hi, sir. Hi, Jignissa, yes. Sir, I want to ask that, uh, what did Anaconda eat mostly? Uh it eats, um, here we give it rats, but in the wild they eat uh, rodents, even other crocodiles and, and uh, caiman and things like that. Okay, so thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. and the last question for today is going to go to Hridan. Hridan. Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, while we're waiting for Hridan, I think Aliyah has had her hand up. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead. Do you have a Gabuna viper? Gabuna. Do you have what? Gaboon. Gaboon viper? No, we don't have Gaboon vipers. We try not to keep snakes that we don't need. And Gaboon vipers are actually found in Africa, not here. Yes. I think, uh, uh, Shana, I'm good for another couple of questions if you're okay with it. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Fine. Um, so we'll go to Aliyah next. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if there's time, would you mind quickly telling us about the anatomy of a snake? It's all very long. <laughs> so, it's, 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 so the snake basically, they have pretty much all the same, most of the same organs as us, but everything is very, very long and cylindrical. So you just imagine lungs that need to be stretched so that everything fits into this tube basically so uh, yeah it's a uh, it's quite a marvel okay thank you all right all right next we're going to go back to rishan i think vidyuta has had her hand up for ages oh yeah i see vidyuta. i think we have five people left with their hands up uh, okay while we're waiting That's for right. rishan vidyuta do you want to Ask your question. Don't you get bitten by the snakes? Uh, when you're holding the snake, do the snake bite you? Who is that? Was that the Yuta? No, it would be Rishma. I saw it. Oh, that was Rishan. Oh, Rishan. Okay. Do the snakes bite you when you're holding them? Uh, Rishan, no, they, 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 they don't bite if I push them to bite. So snakes don't want to bite us. So, uh, so 
So basically, if they don't, uh, if you don't really trouble them, they won't bite. Uh, yeah. So top line. Vidyuta is back as well. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. I went to help my brother. He was crying. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. So, um, do snakes see color? No. Uh, some of them do. Uh, but I mean, snakes uh, eyesight varies from like the the worm snake that has just these two tiny dots that can only sense you know light and dark uh, to some species like the bronzeback tree snake that has really good eyesight and is able to. Uh, spot things from a distance and everything. So um, some snakes can also see color, but none ha have the same spectrum as us. Um, yeah. All right, next we have Divya. Okay, bye, sir. I'm going to leave. I have a, I've got and go and snakes smell and taste food. <laughs> Snakes can smell, uh, they smell with their nostrils, but they can also smell with their tongues. So they flick their tongue out and they collect particles from what's around and the particles get taken to what's called the Jacobson's organ. And that, and it, that tells them what they're, what they're smelling exactly. They can't taste food the way we taste food. They don't have taste buds. All right, next is Kalpana. Okay. Yes, sir. I have written three questions and the first one is, why do snakes don't eat people? Okay. Uh, well, so snakes can't chew uh, and they can't take pieces off. So they have to be really, really big to be able to eat people. Some snakes do, like uh, there have been some instances of large pythons uh, eating people, uh, but it's not, it's not common at all. So that's... Uh, so other and the other snakes can't. None of the snakes that are smaller can swallow a human, so they don't. And uh, what do rattlesnakes eat? Uh, different rattlesnakes eat different things. Uh, there are different species of rattlesnakes. Uh, also, uh, rattlesnakes eat different things as they grow. When they're small, they eat uh, some uh, kind of animal, and then as they grow bigger, a different different kinds of animals. But all in all, they eat insects, small reptiles. Uh, birds and uh, rodents. Uh, how do we capture snakes? You don't capture snakes. This, you, when when you're much older and you uh, and you actually are able to, you can go and learn how to do it somewhere. But until then, it's best not to even think about. How it. do snakes digest? Oh, snakes digest like us. Uh, and but they have a very very strong digestive juices, but they need the warmth around them for them to be able to digest. So if it's not warm, they won't be able to digest. Okay, thank you. Nice to meet. So we'll go You're to Akira now. So my last question is that in a mo in movies like. People kill snakes, but the, the snakes just get injured. Uh, they still get alive. Uh, so the snakes like uh, like give a take a revenge of like twelve years for the person to like to kill it, L like to bite the person like that. Is that true? So that happens. That happens a lot in the movies, but nowhere else. That's uh, not snakes. True. Not true. No, snakes don't take revenge. Uh, they don't remember things from 12 years ago. Uh, they're, they're actually quite chilled out animals. So the thing is, in movies, people make snakes seem like humans. And humans take revenge and hold grudges and all, but snakes don't. Okay. Thank you, sir. So My pleasure. Next is Cornelius. Um, are snakes endangered in India? because of the population of people? Uh, so there are some snakes that are endangered, uh, pythons, for example, uh, and there's a few other snakes that you know, are getting affected by, by things like you know, development and infrastructure and roads and cities. But there are some snakes that do very well around humans. So 
uh, for example, cobras, rat snakes, checkered keelbacks, uh, uh, and a few other species do very well uh, in in cities because so they they sort of like crows, pigeons, and sparrows that do really well in cities and towns. Um, so these are called weed species, and they they actually increase in number when there are people around uh, because people generally have a lot of waste around, and uh, generally that use, uh, leads to uh, more feed for the snakes and that leads to more snakes. Okay, and our last questions, the first is, will be from Rishan. Okay. Do you have rock pythons? No, we don't have rock pythons, but there are wild rock pythons not far from here, just in Nagarhole Tiger Reserve. All right, and the last one from Divya. think Divya had a question. Okay, so I guess that's it for today, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming to Jerry's AMA talk. Uh, I'm going to send out all the information about the farm, but until you're able to get to the farm, Jerry and his wife Chandani, they actually give online classes. I think a lot of the kids who are here in today's talks have attended some of his classes. There's a class going on right now about snakes. There's one about polar bears in the Arctic. So I'll send out all that information on the WhatsApp group. And if you're interested, just tell your parents to sign you up. And why don't we do this? Um, why don't you guys all unmute? Go ahead and unmute yourselves. And on the count of three, why don't we say thank you, Jerry? Ready? One, two, three. Thank you, thank you Jerry. Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Bye. 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 Thank you. We had so Bye. much fun. Bye. 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 Bye.